Settlers of Catan, a popular board game enjoyed by players of all ages. A game that many consider to be casual, family-friendly fun, perfect for a board game night. But what if I told you that Catan has a highly optimized and ruthless strategy set, and that there is a strong community of players who not only prefer to play this way, but are pushing the boundaries of optimized strategy to this day. This is the Settlers of Catan Iceberg Explained. Hello, hello, how's it going? I am Hubsy Wubs, and I have been playing Settlers of Catan semi-competitively on and off for about 18 months. In this video, I am going to introduce several mechanics, strategies, and tactics that competitive Catan players use to gain an edge on their opponents using a tiered iceberg. I'll start out with simple, fundamental mechanics that are universally used by top players, and gradually delve into more advanced and obscure strategies, including some that have caused significant controversy in the competitive scene. So, without further ado, let's get started. The first tier contains introductory strategies surrounding core gameplay mechanics that are explicitly written in the Catan rulebook. A free road or free dev card. After placing their second initial settlement, each player receives one resource from each hex adjacent to their second initial settlement. A vigilant player can take advantage of this and select a second initial settlement that allows them to build a road or buy a development card on turn one. This is called a free road or development card. The opportunity to place on a free road spot or to a lesser extent a free development card spot often carries a lot of weight during placements because it allows the player to immediately make progress towards their win condition or make other players' lives more difficult. Robbing to steal. If on a player's turn, a seven rolls or they play a knight card, they are required to place the robber on a resource hex of their choice and steal a random resource from the hand of another player with a structure adjacent to that hex. One potentially effective use of the robber is to rob with the intent of stealing a resource of need. For example, if player 1 wants a resource in player 2's hand, they can block a hex of theirs and try to steal it. Some situations, particularly in the early game, lend themselves to robbing with the intent to steal. First, if player 1 and player 2 are racing for an important expansion spot, it makes sense to steal road and or settlement resources from each other to help them win the race. And second, if everyone at the table appears to be on approximately even footing, players will often rob from an opponent who has a resource that they need. Robbing to block. Similar to robbing to steal, let's say player one rolls a seven or plays a knight. If player two appears to be ahead of everyone else at the table, player one can block an important high producing resource of theirs and steal from them to slow down their production. When deploying the robber, a player must often choose whether to prioritize the stealing mechanic or the blocking mechanic. This is because there is not usually an available hex that is well suited for both robbing to steal and robbing to block. Barring the exceptions that I listed in the previous item, strong players typically prioritize the blocking mechanic over the stealing mechanic. They decide who they believe is their biggest threat, even if the edge is extremely slim block their most important resource hex, and steal from whoever is most convenient given their previous decision. Ports or Harbors The official Catan rulebook reads, do not underestimate the value of harbors. This is really strong advice, albeit slightly vague. In my opinion, the advice should really read, do not underestimate the value of three for one ports. In my opinion, it is much more important to plan out how to reach a 3-for-1 port than a 2-for-1 resource-specific port. To highlight this, I performed a back-of-the-envelope statistical survey using 70 games that I've posted on YouTube over the last several months. For each game, I recorded the following items for both the winner and the last place finisher. If they settled on a port, if a port they settled on was a 3-for-1 port, and if a port they settled on was a two-for-one port. 
What I found was that the winner was connected to at least one port in 66 of 70 games. In 47 games, they were connected to a 3-for-1 port, and in 44 games, they were connected to a 2-for-1 port. Conversely, the last place finisher was connected to at least one port in 50 of 70 games. In 23 games, they were connected to a 3-for-1 port, and in 45 games, they were connected to a 2-for-1 port. This is obviously a back-of-the-envelope analysis, so please take my conclusions with a grain of salt. With that said, my primary conclusion from the survey is that being connected to a 3-for-1 port is strongly correlated with success. Conversely, there is no significant relationship between connecting to a 2-for-1 port and success. This imperfect survey is merely meant to give you an idea that if you want to play in Win Catan at a high level, you need to understand how you plan to reach a port, especially a 3-for-1 port. Trading. On a player's turn, that player can trade resources with either the bank or another player. In general, it is not advisable to utilize the bank's base 4-for-1 trade unless you have more than 7 cards in your hand and cannot spend your resources on anything else. Conversely, precise trading with your table mates is an essential tool in the competitive player's toolkit. It can gain you resources that you don't produce easily, it can allow you to build a structure cycles early, and it can help build a good rapport with your table mates. Precise trading is not blindly trading away an extra wood for a brick just because you need brick. Precise trading is understanding exactly what you get out of the trade and exactly what your opponent gets out of the trade, and discerning if what you get out of the trade is of equal or greater value to you than what your opponent gets out of the trade. This is much easier said than done, and some items further down this iceberg will help make this easier. But in general, thinking about what your opponent gets out of a trade, even at a surface level, goes a long way towards trading more precisely. In our second tier, I'll discuss some general strategies and game plans that top players use to motivate their initial settlements and in-game decisions. Or we sheep. This strategy entails placing initial settlements on exclusively or wheat and sheep hexes. The goal of this strategy is to quickly build cities and buy development cards. Players typically struggle to expand with this strategy because they don't produce wood or brick themselves. However, they make up for it by trading for their wood and brick, or stealing wood or brick with knight development cards. A successful or wheat sheep setup typically reaches 10 points with something approximating 3 cities, largest army, and 2 victory point development cards, aka VPs, plus or minus an extra settlement if they don't draw enough VPs. Hybrid or wheat sheep. This strategy is very similar to the or wheat sheep strategy in that it contains initial settlements almost entirely comprised of ore, wheat, and sheep but differs in that it includes a splash of either wood or brick. Hybrid or wheat sheep exchanges reduced city and development card production for improved expansion prospects. As a result, there is a wider variance in how a successful hybrid or wheat sheep setup reaches 10 points. In general though, the bulk of the points still tends to come from a combination of cities, largest army, and VPs. This is one of the two most common winning setups in competitive play. Longest Road or Road Builder This strategy entails placing initial settlements on primarily wood and brick hexes. The goal of this strategy is to pump out roads and settlements early, take and hold Longest Road, and either build cities or buy the development cards required to reach 10 points. The road builder strategy tends to excel in the early game because it produces huge amounts of road and settlement resources. However, it tends to struggle in the late game because it does not produce enough wheat or ore to build cities consistently or fight for largest army. Strong players typically make up for this by using the increased production from their early expansions to port or trade for their ore or wheat. A successful road builder setup is typically comprised of Longest Road, 
five settlements, and whichever of city's largest army or VPs most conveniently helps them reach 10 points. Port strategy. This strategy entails placing initial settlements near a desirable port and on hexes containing large amounts of the resource corresponding to said port. This setup is often unbalanced and slow to expand at first because it sacrifices balanced production for a greater amount of port fuel. With that said, if a player trades effectively enough to quickly settle on the desired port, this strategy is absolutely competitive. Once the port is online, the player typically has an edge in whatever win condition they set their mind to, despite having to inefficiently pay two port resources for resources that they don't produce themselves. Success or failure of the port strategy often comes down to if the player can use their late game edge to make up for their slower early game. Five resource. This strategy is exactly what it sounds like and is the other most common winning setup next to hybrid or wheat sheep that is seen in competitive play. The goal of the strategy is to place on initial settlements that provide direct access to all five resources. This strategy is extremely versatile and attempts to strike a balance between expansion, city building, and development cards. One weakness of the five resource strategy is that it relies on a strong balance in the production of paired resources such as wood and brick or ore and wheat. Without this balance, a player's hand can get stuck with resources that they can't use. Something else to keep in mind is that the versatility of a five resource strategy is a double-edged sword. Although this strategy can win in a million different ways, it often does not produce enough ore, wheat, or sheep to play a competitive or wheat sheep strategy, or does not produce enough wood or brick to play a competitive road building strategy. As a result, successfully navigating the five resource strategy relies on a strong intuition of what win condition others at the table are competing for. That way you can choose the win condition that you think gives you the best winning chances. In our third tier, I will discuss some of the simplest in-game tactics that competitive players have in their toolkit to help them gain an edge. These tactics require varying amounts of effort, but work wonders when applied effectively. Card tracking. Although the cards in each player's hand are technically face down, the dice rolls from which the players gain resources are public knowledge. The only semi-private resource transaction is when players steal from each other with the robber. As a result, with practice, a strong player can track the contents of their opponent's hands with almost 100% accuracy. Now it's honest disclaimer time. This is one of the most difficult tactics to execute on this entire iceberg. If I was ordering this iceberg by difficulty alone, I would place card tracking pretty close to the bottom because even the most seasoned competitors struggle with it. However, the strategy itself is extremely simple in concept, and even being able to track resources at an inconsistent, hand-wavy level pays immediate dividends. It is an essential component of most of the strategies shown in the rest of this video. Plowing Often, two players are racing for the same expansion spot, or it is in the table's best interest to limit the expansion prospects of a specific player. When one player plows another player, it means that they build roads along a hex or settle on an expansion spot with the primary intention of preventing another player from doing so. This can occur in a variety of contexts for a variety of reasons. In fact, the rest of the table can help one player plow another player by accepting trades that disproportionately benefit the player doing the plowing. Plowing can be especially devastating when done against an ore wheat sheep player because their roads are extremely valuable and wasting a road sets back their expansion by several turns. Pre-roll night blocks. Let's say the robber is blocking a player's resource hex and they plan to play a knight on their turn to get the robber off of them. On their turn, they do not have to begin by rolling the dice. They can play a development card first. In this scenario, if they plan to play the knight on their turn anyway, it is almost always optimal to play the knight before rolling the dice. At best, the 
number of their formerly blocked hex or the hex they choose to block rolls. At worst, another number rolls and it's net neutral. The only situation in which this is not optimal is if the player with the knight has exactly seven cards in hand. By blocking pre-dice roll, they have to seal a card and put themselves at eight cards and risk sevening out when they roll their dice for turn. Even if their resource is blocked, it is more likely that a seven rolls than whatever the number is of the resource that's being blocked. As a result, in the long run, you will seven out more frequently than you will miss out on whatever resource is being blocked. So in short, if your resource is blocked and you have a knight, play it before rolling the dice for your turn unless you have exactly seven cards in hand. Non-block. Even if nobody at the table has bought a development card yet, the power to block and rob that comes with rolling a seven or playing a knight can be used proactively. For example, if player one offers player two a trade and player two is not quite willing to accept it, player one can add a stipulation that if player two accepts the trade, player one will not block them the next time they control the robber. Because blocking a player's most important resource can be absolutely devastating, adding this offer can sweeten the pot and can be the nudge that convinces player two to accept player one's offer. Non-steal. Similar to, but distinct from a non-block, a non-steal is a promise that player one, the next time they control the robber, will not steal a resource from player two. It may seem pedantic to distinguish a non-steal from a non-block because they often look identical, but the difference between them is important in several scenarios. For example, if one player has multiple ore and wheat spots, but has a perfect city in hand, they may be compelled to ask for a non-steal instead of a non-block during trade negotiations. Their ore and wheat are sort of unblockable, so getting blocked is arguably less impactful for them than losing their perfect city that they already have in hand. Future Trade the power to block and rob is not the only thing that players can utilize proactively. They can use resources that they have not yet gained proactively as well. For example, let's say player one produces a lot of brick, but does not currently have any brick in their hand and is negotiating a trade with player two who does not produce brick. To seal the deal, player one can add a stipulation that if player two accepts the trade, player one will trade the next brick that they produce to player two for a resource of player two's choice. This is mutually beneficial because it presumably allows player one to have an immediate impactful turn and gives player two a future resource that they don't produce easily. In our fourth tier, I'll discuss some more complex strategies that are still used consistently at the Catan table. None of these strategies are thought to be in poor taste at the top level, but if you're playing casually with your family or solo queuing in a Catan Universe game, your opponents may get a little annoyed at you. Dirty Mono This is a classic strategy that has ironically been embraced by the competitive scene as fair play. As you may know, one development card that you can draw is called a Monopoly. It allows a player, on their turn, to steal all of one resource from the hands of the rest of the table. This card is extremely powerful, but becomes even stronger if the player successfully executes the dirty mono. If a player knows that they are going to Monopoly on their turn, they can purposefully trade away the resource that they plan to Monopoly for before they play their Monopoly. This gives them compensation for any Monopoly resource that they currently have in their hand. Immediately after trading, they play the Monopoly, which gives them the resource back that they traded away, and the rest of that resource that was in everybody else's hand in the first place. Counterintuitively, this tactic is not considered dirty or cheap by the competitive scene, because players are expected to be card tracking and situationally aware enough to understand what times are opportunistic for monopolies. In other words, if you fall for a dirty mono, 
it's your fault for not considering that your opponent's down development card might be a monopoly. I've played games where a suspicious trade was offered, and the players warned each other that a dirty mono might be afoot. Extortion. When a player rolls a 7 or plays a knight, they don't have to just block a hex, rob from a player, and move on with their turn. They can strong arm the player that they may or may not plan to block into doing something desirable for them. For example, if player 1 does not produce brick and player 2, who they plan to block, has brick in hand, player 1 can say, I'm going to block you right now unless you give me something. If I don't block you this turn, will you trade me a brick for a resource of my choice? The thing that's given could be an immediate trade, a future trade, a future non-block, an agreement to not race for a particular settlement spot, you name it. This tactic can maximize the power of a knight or a fortuitous seven, especially in the early game when the pace is slower and there's more time to react if someone jumps out to a big lead. Insurance. In my opinion, one of the more annoying things that can happen in a game of Catan is rolling a 7 when you have more than 7 cards in hand and discarding half your hand, aka 7ing out. Top players sometimes use something called insurance to mitigate 7ing out. Let's say it's player 2's turn, and player 1 has 8 cards while player 2 has 4 cards. Now, let's say player 2 agrees to give player 1 insurance. Essentially, player 2 agrees to accept a 2-for-1 trade on their turn so that player 1's hand size goes down to 7 cards, and agrees not to use whatever resources they receive from the trade on their turn. Then, on player 1's turn, player 1 agrees to give back the resource they received from player 2 in exchange for one of the two resources that they gave to player 2 earlier. Player 1 benefits from this because they essentially pay Player 2 a resource of their choice to guarantee that they don't 7 out on their turn, and Player 2 benefits because they gain a resource for holding on to Player 1's extra cards for a turn. Defensive Trade In certain situations, a player will accept a trade not because it is particularly helpful for them, but because it prevents another player from accepting the trade. For example, let's say player 1 and 2 are both one resource away from a settlement. Now, let's say that a trade is shaping up that perfectly gives both of them settlements. Player 3 can realize this and accept the trade with one player, which prevents the other player from completing their settlement. It may not feel great in the moment, but player 3 giving only one player a settlement is better for them than both players giving each other settlements. Ideally, player 3 would diagnose which player of the two is less of a threat and negotiate a trade with the lower threat player. That way they are quasi-blocking the bigger threat at the table. Calling out opponent's resources. This tactic is a direct application of card tracking. High-level players will commonly call out an opponent's holdings to nudge their opponents towards decisions that benefit them. For example, let's say player 1 rolls a 7 and is deciding who to block. If player 2 has a sheep in hand and player 3 knows that player 1 needs sheep, they can propose that player 1 block player 2 to steal their sheep, even if it is not in player 1's best interest to do so. Similarly, if player 1 and player 2 are discussing a trade that gives player 1 a city, player 3 can chime in and tell player 2, you know that this trade gives player 1 a city, right? That could spook player 2 and convince them to retract the trade. This tactic works particularly well if your opponents are not card tracking, and if the advice that you're giving has at least a kernel of truth to it. In the 7 example, Player 1 honestly needs sheep, and in the trade example, it's generally pretty bad value to accept a trade that gives another player a city, so you're giving semi-honest advice. Now, you may ask, is this tactic still effective if all players involved are card tracking? In my opinion, as long as you're tracking accurately, it is. At worst, they ignore you and make the decision that doesn't benefit you anyway and at best, you convince them to make a decision that benefits you. 
In addition, calling out desirable cards or what an opponent gets out of a trade opens up a discussion about your opponent's holdings. This pretty much only benefits you because it gives you more information about what your opponents are thinking about. There is a small risk of a petty opponent deciding, I wasn't going to block you before, but because of your table talk, I'm going to block you now. But I don't think this is good strategy because they should be placing the robber based on who they think the biggest threat is, not who happened to chime in when they were making their decision. Leveraging multiple offers. Occasionally, multiple players will accept a player's trade offer. This breeds a unique opportunity for the player offering the trade. If player one is offering the trade, they can tell players two and three that whoever gives them a second card will get the trade. Often, one player wants the trade enough that they're willing to pay the tax to guarantee the transaction. This is a clever method of extracting an extra resource from a simple trade negotiation. In our fifth tier, I'll discuss some of the most complex and self-interested strategies in Catan that are still seen as acceptable by the competitive scene. These tactics are rarely seen outside the competitive scene because they are extremely situational, complex, and in some cases, ruthless. Opportunistic upcharging. In Catan, there are high impact situations that can effectively win and lose players the game. For example, because there is a limited amount of real estate in a four player game, two players will often race for the same expansion spot. This breeds an opportunity for the players not in the race. Let's say player one and player two are racing for an expansion spot and player two has enough resources in hand to beat player one to the expansion spot. On player one's turn, player three can make a ridiculously expensive trade offer to player one for the resource of need with the understanding that player one loses a lot of ground if they lose the race. Another example of upcharging is if player one and two are fighting for longest road, player three can charge ridiculous prices to both players for wood or brick. Because both players need those resources, they are both willing to pay an artificially inflated price for them. Opportunistic upcharging can result in extremely unbalanced trades that can be great value for player three. Double trade back out. For the record, I couldn't find an official name for this tactic, but it absolutely happens in games. In the previous tier, I explained that a player can leverage multiple offers to gain a second card from someone. This may be a high reward tactic, but it also carries higher risk. If player one tries to get an extra card and players two and three don't like that they are being pitted against each other, they can talk to each other and agree to simultaneously back out of the trade. This is much easier to do over the table than online because over the table, the players can actually talk to each other. Whereas in Catan Universe, once a player makes an offer or counter offer, they can't withdraw it. Regardless, this can be an extremely effective punishment for player one if both players two and three perceive that they are getting greedy. Threatening a plow or a blocking settlement. When I described extortion earlier, I described it in the context of the robber. However, this is not the only way that you can extort other players. A different, less common opportunity comes during initial placements or in very specific racing situations. For example, on this board, let's say I'm placing on the turn. In this spot, the 843 and the 910 would get me five resources and would cut green off from the sheep port. Instead of just picking those spots and moving on with my life, I could tell green, hey, I'm considering taking the 910. If I don't take the 910 and take the 5910 wood wheat instead, will you trade me the first ore that you get for the resource of my choice? This leverages my ability to mess with Green's game to potentially gain me an extra ore. This opportunity also applies when you have the chance to plow an opponent. For example, on this board, I have the resources that I need to plow Brown. However, I could say, hey Brown, I won't plow you if you give me this ridiculous trade. Threatening a plow or a blocking settlement is an extremely situational but effective opportunity to force value out of your opponent. Resource feeding. This is more of a concept than a specific tactic. 
Explaining this concept makes more sense with an example. In this game, Purple takes longest road and is at nine points. This is scary for everyone at the table except Purple because Purple is one point away from winning. Seeing this, I reach out to Pink, who is only at five points, and offer them resources to help them fight Purple for road. Using those resources, Pink steals longest road, putting both Pink and Purple at seven points. Pink and Purple both being at seven points is much less scary for me as a front runner than Pink just being out of the game and Purple being at nine points. Essentially, resource feeding entails convincing and helping the least threatening player to fight the most threatening player for their win condition. In my previous example, Longest Road was Purple's win condition. However, it can also be useful to feed the smallest threat development card materials if the biggest threat needs largest army, or plowing materials if the biggest threat needs to build another settlement to win. Sometimes giving unbalanced trades or feeding your opponent's resources can be advantageous to everyone in the long run. Selling port rights. Per the Catan rules, each two-for-one port can only be controlled by one player. However, this does not mean that the rest of the table cannot make use of the port. The port's controller can effectively sell use of the port for a one resource fee. For example, let's say player 2 controls the wheat port and player 1 has a lot of wheat but no port. On player 2's turn, they can trade a resource of their choice to player 1 for 2 wheat and an extra card. Then player 2 can port the wheat for a resource of player 1's choice and trade it back to player 1 for the card that they initially traded away. One clarifying note is that this is only legal if it is done on player 2's turn, because a player can only port resources on their turn. Selling port rights is especially useful for both players if player 2 is trying to feed player 1 road or development card materials. If the situation is dire enough, I could honestly picture player 2 doing this for free. This could also be useful as a variant of insurance, where player 1 has 8 cards and Buying port access brings their hand down to six cards. At the end of the day, sharing or selling port rights is a mutually beneficial tactic that gives player two resources and gives player one resources of need that they couldn't obtain otherwise. In our bottom tier, I'll discuss strategies that are occasionally seen over the Catan table and in the online Catan scene, but that many members of the community consider to either be bad etiquette or against the unwritten rules of the game. Some tactics are explicitly banned from online and in-person tournaments, while others are allowed to be done at your own risk. Free resources. The Settlers of Catan rulebook states that a player is not allowed to give a resource to another player for free. However, players can skirt around this rule by performing a series of non-binding 2-for-1 and 1-for-1 trades. For example, let's say player 1 trades a wheat and a brick to player 2 for a sheep, then trades the sheep back to player 2 for the brick that they just traded away. The net result appears to be that player 2 received a free wheat. An analogous sequence of transactions occurred during a $1,000 Catan cash tournament and stirred up a ton of drama because it was unclear in the standardized tournament rules if the result was legal. Delighted made a great video, which I have put in this video's description, discussing the controversy in more detail. Eventually, this sequence was ruled as legal in official, nationally run Catan tournaments, so you can do this without fear. With that said, the community is still torn as to if this was the right ruling, so applying the tactic may stir up some controversy at the table. Kingmaking Kingmaking is when one player knowingly accepts a trade that allows another player to win the game when they otherwise would not have been able to. For example, let's say player 1 is sitting at 9 points, has 3 wheat and 2 ore in hand, and offers the table a wheat for an ore trade. Player 2 then accepts the trade knowing that it gives player 1 a winning city. In this scenario, player 2 would be called a kingmaker. If a kingmaking incident occurs in a tournament or colonist community event, both the trade offerer and the kingmaker are given 0 points for the game. Now looking at this, you may ask, where is the strategy in kingmaking? Here's where the strategy comes in. 
Determining if a trade that wins someone the game was offered or accepted maliciously can be extremely difficult at times, especially at lower levels. Even the most official tournaments appear to judge this on a case-by-case basis. During informal tournaments, I've seen players calculate that they will land at a more favorable future table by placing second or third than by winning, and as a result, subtly throw their game in a way that's nearly impossible to objectively call kingmaking. Similarly, I've seen players realize that one of their opponents winning is more beneficial to their seeding than another opponent winning, and subtly not stop them from winning. Even if it's nearly impossible to pin down, kingmaking and throwing games is bad business, and you should never do it. Please just play to win. Trading with the bot. If you play online on Catan Universe or on Colonist, you will experience people quitting early, losing connection, or generally being replaced by bots. These bots are... bad at the game. <laughs> They are generally harmless compared to top-level players, but their programming has one flaw that can significantly affect four-player games. They make and accept horrible trade offers. As a result, a self-interested player should naturally be tempted to take advantage of this and constantly trade with the bot. However, this practice is generally frowned upon in the community. There is no explicit rule against it in Catan Universe, but it is against the rules to trade with a bot in colonist community tournaments. I'm not particularly proud of this, but if I'm playing with a bot on Catan Universe, I will trade with the bot only if someone else at the table trades with the bot first and nobody else at the table gets mad. My weak justification is that if I tell the table not to trade with the bot and they ignore me, I'm playing at a distinct disadvantage. What I should probably do is tell the rest of the table that they shouldn't trade with the bot and see if they agree to it before trading with the bot myself. But alas, I am not perfect. Revenge blocking. Revenge blocking is not so much a tactic to gain a strategic edge, but more a tactic to gain an emotional edge. Revenge blocking first entails player two blocking player one, typically in the early game. Then, as a result, player one proceeds to block player two at the next several opportunities, regardless of how player two is doing in the game. The idea is that revenge blocking gives player one an image at the table that makes the rest of the table wary of blocking them in the future. I know I have definitely hesitated to block someone a second time because they revenge blocked me three times and told me to my face that they were revenge blocks. This strategy can work occasionally, but is flawed in the long run. The player being blocked by the revenge blocker is not always the biggest game threat, so revenge blocking often means letting the biggest game threat run away with the game. It is generally understood in the community that the knight is supposed to be placed on the most important hex on the biggest threat. If a player clearly knows who the biggest threat is, and they willingly choose to block someone else, that can be perceived as throwing, and that's a recipe to get the rest of the table very angry in a hurry. Breaking your word. There is technically no rule in Catan against breaking your word. Even Colonist and the U.S. Catan National Championship do not explicitly ban lying. However, breaking your word is easily the most controversial and rage-inducing act that one can commit over a Catan board. Top players breaking their word during relatively low-stakes exhibition matches have caused legitimate rifts in friendships that have lasted years. It is generally agreed upon in the community that players should not break their word. But at the end of the day, if breaking your word legally is the only thing that stands between you and a $1,000 grand prize, it's mighty tempting, no? What would you do? Well, that's it from me. If there are any strategies or tactics that I missed, if you disagree with any of my rankings, if you think certain tactics should be banned or unbanned, or just have anything else on your mind, please feel free to leave a comment down below. If you found this video interesting or informative and want more content like this, please hit that like and subscribe button. It helps out the channel a ton. See ya! If player two appears to be head, plowing can be expected. In fact, the rest of the player Um, if I don't block you this turn, will you trade me a brick for a resource of my choice? 
on player two's turn, they can trade a resource. So stupid. Oh my goodness. I will trade with the bot only if someone else at the table. Oh, doesn't burn. Um, even colonists. Oh. If you have the, 